Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for sticking around. I hope everyone's enjoyed the summit so far. Uh, as Veronica introduced, my name is Jeanette O. Oh. I am a senior investment coordinator here at RPAG. And today I wanted to spend some time talking about something that's very important to our system, which is the scorecard, as well as some other fund research tools that are available to you in the portal. So to start, uh, the first few slides here, I just wanted to start off with kind of like this 30,000 foot overview of what the scorecard is, why we've created it. And I think a really great place to start is by asking the question, what is the scorecard designed to do? And I'd say the answer to that is pretty simple. The scorecard was created as a way for us to evaluate funds, looking at a multitude of criteria uh, with the with the end result of that just being a super straightforward 10-point numerical scoring system that could be then used to monitor funds as well as managers. The scorecard has three main objectives, and the first one that I really wanted to highlight is that it can be used to identify skillful managers. And I know that can be pretty tough uh, differentiating those managers that are truly exceptional in the space, especially when we're looking to either add a manager or maybe replace one within our lineup. And so uh, what's really great about the scorecard is that we look at a ton of different metrics that not only observe a manager's performance over the short term, but over an entire market cycle. Additionally, the scorecard can be used to enhance the investment due diligence process. And what we mean by that is the scorecard really allows plan sponsors to analyze the different asset classes, looking at metrics that are more complex and in-depth than just the fund's return streams or their expenses. And the last objective of the scorecard that I wanted to talk about was that it can help minimize your exposure to fiduciary liability by creating a process that is both repeatable and documentable. In terms of benefits, I think there are three main benefits that I wanted to spend some time talking about today. And the first is that the score is a simple, single, easy to understand number. Mm -hmm. So funds will receive a score on a scale of zero to 10, zero being the worst, 10 being the best. And what's great is that that single number can be used to also drive action when applicable. And really what we mean by that is when we're looking at a fund score, if it scores between seven and 10, uh, we consider that acceptable, meaning that is a really great candidate to either maintain within your lineup or add it into your lineup. Funds that score uh, between a five or a six will put on the watch list, and that's noted with a yellow flag. And anything below that, so zero to four, funds are uh, up for review is what we call them. And they're, they're also flagged in our system. So once you're in that considerations page in the FIR, you'll be uh, asked to make an action to it, whether that's no action or maybe replacing it with the fund or eliminating it. Um, but I really wanted to emphasize that those flags don't necessitate action. What that really does is it just signals that additional due diligence may need to be conducted, whether that's actually sitting down with the manager or maybe taking some time to really look at the scorecard and see what metrics the fund is struggling in. Um, so that's just a nice little action item there for you. And any of those actions, whether it's adding or maintaining uh, the fund within your lineup or watch listing it or, or putting it up for review, all of those actions can be integrated directly into the investment policy statement to, again, create that repeatable and documentable process for your clients. And I alluded to this very briefly with that last point, but the last benefit of the, of the scorecard that I wanted to highlight is that it could be used to easily identify those areas of concern. So we like to consider the scorecard as almost like an x-ray. And once you take that picture, uh, looking at those individual metrics that we observe in the scorecard, the scorecard can actually tell us in what areas a fund may be struggling in. Maybe it's losing points in style and we need to dig deeper into what's really going on there. Uh, maybe it's risk return or a peer group ranking or maybe even a qualitative factor like manager tenure or expenses. And so. 
Uh, the scorecard does a really great job of highlighting where exactly those problem areas may be. So now that we've kind of established this foundation of what the scorecard is and what our main objectives are, I'm going to spend the next few slides here going over how RPAG actually scores these funds. And the first point to make here is that RPAG categorizes funds into three main buckets or lenses, as we like to say, and that's your active, passive, and asset allocation. What's really great about putting these funds into those categories is that it allows us to customize analytics within each of those scorecards to the funds or the investment strategies goals. All scores in our system are built on pass-fail analytics, uh, as well as put on a scale from 0 to 10, 0 being the worst, 10 being the best. In terms of general structure, 80% of the fund score is quantitative in nature is quantitative in nature, looking at things like returns-based style analysis, quadratic optimization, as well as peer group analysis, while the remaining 20% of the score looks at qualitative or quality factors, as we like to say, considering things like manager tenure, fund expenses, and strength of statistics. So the first investment strategy or scorecard that we have is for our active funds. And for our active funds, RPAG requires five years of monthly returns to score in our system. And the reason why we've picked five years is because we're able to then analyze a manager's performance over an entire market cycle. But those 60 data points also allow us to say that each of the observations within the scorecard are statistically significant. So that's why we really like that five-year number. And as I mentioned in a previous slide, the main objective of the scorecard is to identify those skillful managers. And when we really break down what the ideal active manager is providing, uh, we like to boil it down to four points, with the first being style purity. We want a manager that's going to stay true to the fund's stated objective, right? Because say we're looking to diversify the plan's lineup by adding a large cap growth fund, well, it does us no good if that manager is going down in market cap, investing in the mid cap space, or buying value stocks. We want managers that are going to do well in the large cap growth style. And so that's why the RPAG scorecard actually places a 30% weight to style in our analysis. Of course, with active management, we want those managers that are going to outperform in both the short and long-term long periods, uh, whether that's relative or absolute to its benchmark. But with that, not only do we want managers to do well against their benchmark, we want, those, we want to find those managers that are able to rank well against their peers. And so we place a pretty strong emphasis on high peer, peer group rankings. And the last point that I wanted to make here is that the ideal active manager is going to have long track record. The reason why we place such an emphasis on manager tenure with active management is because when we look at five years of monthly returns, we want to make sure that each of those observations or each of the data points that we look at is going to be attributable to the management team that's in place. It does us no good if a fund is doing well, but it's had three PM changes or portfolio manager changes over the last five years because then it becomes hard to discern, well, which manager does that strong performance come from? Is it a mixture of all three or is there one that did really outstanding? And so uh, with our active, actively managed funds, we really place a high emphasis on having manager tenure. Some other points that we use in our uh, evaluation of active funds is that RPAG uses industry standard benchmarks specific to each asset class. And so what that really looks like is for our uh, US equities, that's going to be the Russell indices. International will be MSCI. Blue, uh, fixed income will be Bloomberg, Barclays, and et cetera. It's specific to each asset class. And the last point here is that RPG actually creates custom peer groups that omit passive funds from the space to really create that apples to apples comparison 
and to create a more competitive peer group uh, environment for that analysis. Here's what the active scorecard looks like. Uh, it's going to follow that 80% quantitative, 20% qualitative split. But once we break down what the actual quantitative factors looks at, 30%, as mentioned, is weighted to style, 30% to those risk return factors, and 20% to peer group rankings. The next category or bucket that we look at are our passive funds. And our evaluation process looks a little different relative to our uh, active funds in that our PAG only requires three years of monthly returns for passive funds to score in our system. And the main reason that we've made this change is because with our index managers, we don't need to look for outperformance anymore. We don't necessarily need to wait for an entire market cycle to know if the ideal or the great skillful passive manager is tracking their benchmark well. And so with that, the ideal passive manager is going to be very consistent with their style, uh, track their benchmark very tightly, and also have low costs. Again, emphasizing that we don't need to pay uh, such a high premium that comes with active management with our passive managers because we're not looking for that outperformance. Uh, the same qualities apply here for our passive funds as do active in that RPG is still using those industry standard benchmarks specific to each asset class. And this time the, the custom peer group is going to actually omit active funds from the space so that we are comparing passive to passive. Here's what the passive scorecard looks like. You'll notice that it does look a little different from our active scorecard. Um, we've increased the weighting to style and tracking factors to 40%. We've gotten rid of that risk return factor weighting entirely with our passive funds. And instead, we've also increased uh, our weighting to peer group rankings. And in addition, a lot of the metrics, we've, we've narrowed the threshold or criteria just so that we can truly identify those managers that are uh, truly skillful in tracking their benchmarks well. The last group of funds that I wanted to go over are the asset allocation funds. And really what we mean by that are going to be your target date funds, your risk-based series, balance funds, multi-sector bond funds, or any other multi-asset strategies. The evaluation looks pretty similar to our active scorecard in that our PAG requires five years of performance history to score. Again, we do want to identify those managers that are able to outperform their benchmark over the short and long-term periods. And we want a management team that's been there in place for a long time as well as rank well against their peers. In terms of what's different, we've actually swapped out a few of the style analytics in the asset allocation scorecard to better evaluate diversification by these managers. And another really key differentiator with our asset al allocation evaluation is that our PAG creates custom style benchmarks for each individual asset allocation fund and so we're no longer using those industry standard benchmarks anymore. And the real reason behind that is when we're considering two target date funds and we look at, say, like the 2050 vintages of those two separate target date funds, when you look at the allocations to the different asset classes, sometimes they can be completely different from each other. And so it could be really difficult to just use one standardized benchmark to conduct this evaluation or analysis. So our PAG's solution to that was to then use returns-based style analysis to create a custom benchmark for each individual fund. Again, you'll note that um, this scorecard looks very similar to our active strategy scorecard. But as I mentioned, we've made a few changes under those style factors we're no longer considering style analysis and drift anymore, but instead we are looking at risk level and style diversity to better evaluate um, diversification by the manager. 
So we've talked about the three lenses or buckets in which RPAG categorizes these funds. And the last scorecard that I want to touch on here is one that RPAG's created specific to target date strategies. And this really came to be following the 2013 DOL tip sheet that was released. And basically, for those of you who are not familiar with what that says, the DOL came out and said that while it's important for plans, plan advisors and sponsors to evaluate the allocation portion of these target date strategies, uh, another really important factor is that these, these strategies are fund of funds. And so uh, not only do you have to consider the allocation portion, but also consider the underlying funds and how well the manager is, is selecting these options. So RPAG's solution was then to kind of create this composite score, um, looking at both the asset allocation score from that scorecard that we just saw in the previous slide, and mixing that with a 50-50 weighting to the selection score of the underlying funds as well. And so the ultimate result of that is going to be this blended or a composite score for our target date strategies. Okay, so I know that was a lot of talking from me, probably maybe a little too fast, but I did want to stop and see if there were any questions from the group before we move on to the second portion of this presentation. Yes. When did the <clears throat> composite score start reflecting in the system? Uh, it was released in 2013 following the DOL. Oh, pitch. so a long time. Yes, so it's, it's been in place for a while now. Is that the composites, <clears throat> you can list those out separately, right? So when you pull a scorecard for a target date fund, it'll show you the, the asset allocation score for that series as well as the selection score. So you'll be able to see those side okay. by side okay. and see how um, those come, like, are calculated into the blended score. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. The IPS that goes together with the scorecard when you mentioned a score of four or below, yes, your wording was evaluate or whatever wording you used. I guess my interpretation of the IPS is basically it needs to be replaced. Am, am I wrong with that? Is the wording more lenient than what I'm thinking? You may be referring to uh, some old language that we've had in the past. Uh, I believe that that zero to four range was labeled as up for review which after reviewing with our team thought maybe it might be a too, too aggressive in that wording. And so we did make an update uh, about a, a year and a half, almost two years ago, I wanna say, to up for review, um, just because our intent with that was to really promote advisors to not necessarily see a score four below and immediately remove it from the lineup, but to encourage uh, taking some time to do additional due diligence with that. So it, it was you. up for removal, and then now it's up for review. Yes, that's correct. Any other questions? Okay, perfect. So in the second half, of this presentation, I wanted to go over or highlight some of the great fund research tools that are available to you in the portal. Starting with our fund lookup tool. Seems pretty simple, but you'll be able to see the fund lookup tool in that blue menu toolbar up at the top. And really with this tool, you can type in a ticker or just a fund name. Uh, use it as like a search engine for your funds, and uh, you'll be able to receive a multitude of results here. Uh, one quick note about the Fund Lookup tool is that uh, there is some back-end logic to show some sorting. And so the system will always sort funds to show uh, funds with the highest score, and then the highest information ratio, as well as the lowest expense. So that's something to always keep in mind uh, when you're doing a search in Fund Lookup. But if you're looking to get more specific with your search, maybe you have a certain asset class in mind or you want to um, pull from a specific investment source and product that your plan is eligible for, the filter icon right at the edge of the search 
bar up there is a really great way to narrow down your search because, you know, if you just press enter, there's more than 100,000 funds in our system and that can get pretty overwhelming too. So uh, I really recommend using the filter icon to narrow down your search and help with any um, specific searches that you're doing. The next resource that we have available to you is our asset class review. And I don't know if a majority of advisors are just pulling a scorecard and calling it a day, but uh, if you are looking to conduct some additional due diligence on any funds that maybe aren't scoring seven to 10, I really recommend pulling the asset class review. I look at this almost every day when I'm about to hop on a call with a manager it's the first thing that I pull just to get a better picture of what's really happening with the fund. This report is about 10 to 12 pages, I believe. And what it really does is it graphically or visually um, shows you what's going on with the score. And so if, you're, if there's some difficulty understanding, well, I don't understand why this fund is failing in style, we have the style maps to show you um, where it might be losing the points in, or if there's any, um, if you're having a hard time understanding why it's losing a point in peer group rankings, we have those graphs in there, as well as some additional da data points in there that you could reference as well for your meeting. So just all around a really great resource that's available to you in the system. Now I know Reese mentioned this in his presentation earlier, but another one that I wanted to highlight were our strategy equivalents. And this was a feature that we added almost a, a little over a year ago now. And strategy equivalents is a really great, great way to conduct due diligence or dive deeper and understand the performance of any of our RPA GCITs that maybe do not have enough performance history to score on their own yet. Or maybe there was a sub-advisor change at some time, and so the CIT performance is not completely representative of the current manager that's in place. So that's just another really great way to get some additional talking points. The last two tools that I want to go over are uh, just some really great resources that are available to you uh, in conducting additional due diligence. And the first one that I wanted to highlight is our stable value analyzer. The stable value analyzer is, um, you know, we talked about funds that score in the system, but RPAG actually does not score those cash equivalent or capital preservation funds or investments like your money market, stable value, uh, guaranteed investment contracts. And so RPAG's solution was to create the stable value analyzer to um, that it's updated quarterly on a quarterly basis. We reach out to all of our providers asking for general information on the different stable value or GIC options in the market, looking um, for reporting things like the crediting rate, credit quality, market to book ratio. And so this is just a really great tool when if you have a stable value fund in your lineup to be able to have um, a document to show or a report to show to your clients. And the last tool that we have here is our target date fund analyzer. Uh, not gonna spend too much time on this because I know that our next presentation will actually walk through an entire fit analysis, but just another great resource that's available to you to conduct some due diligence on the different target date uh, options that are available to you in uh, the market. So that's all that I had. Do we have any last minute questions before I pass it off to our next presenter. Yes, in the front. Sorry if I'm hogging all the questions. No. Um, <clears throat> is there like a flag or something to change? Or, and maybe this is just run the report, but like if the manager leaves, can we get any kind of like notification like for that? Is that, is that a possibility or is that some kind of notifications about when some sort of criteria we set, particularly the Manager change is the big one. For yeah, so for a qualitative factor like yeah. manager tenure, typically it won't be denoted specifically if a PM is leaving right. as long as it doesn't affect the score. Okay. So say there's only one manager in the fund, 15 years, like incredibly long tenure, they leave and now manager tenure point is back to zero years, then that will show as a T in the scorecard. 
Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I guess it'd be it'd be hard to note that anyway. And then the other question I have is, <clears throat> is there like, if something isn't scoring well, is there anywhere that you have like fund manager comments? This may just be a general question mm-hmm. outside of RPAG, but is there any kind of like fund manager comments? Well, here's the reason why we did this. Cause I'm always kind of curious, you know, sometimes I'll, there'll be a new fund we'll add. And then two quarters later, it's like, what's going on with it? Yeah. And it'd be nice to know some verbiage mm-hmm. to either pull the trigger, like, okay, move it or explain to the client what's going on with it. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for our RPAG CITs, we do release commentaries every quarter. And so, uh, but that is pretty limited to our RPAG CITs. Those are the only ones that we're really doing a deep dive on uh, making sure that we get updates every quarter. In terms of general fund commentary, I do believe uh, we have a team that can provide like score commentary for you. So if you just reach out to our support team at support at rpag.com, you can ask them to write up a, kind of like a generic fund commentary on the specific fund that you're looking for. Personally, I like to use Morningstar as well as a second reference. Um, because I know that they have their analysts do some additional commentary. But um, I, if it's not an RPAG CIT, I would definitely reach out to someone on our support team to see if that's something that we can also provide for you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other final questions? Okay. I'm not seeing any, but thank you so much for your time, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of the day.